recent review of the payments industry has thrown up some surprising insights. While legacy payments remain among the most widely used mechanisms, emerging electronic payment methods are recording some of the highest levels of growth. There's also a marked disparity, in disparity I should say, in adoption rates for some payment mechanisms between different regions, along with a sense of competition between FIs and fintechs, with both sides having much to gain. To look at this in more detail, we can speak to Carl Slabicki, co-head of Global Payments for BNY Mellon's Treasury Services. Welcome, Carl, our third guest of the morning. It feels like it's going so fast already. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying your Cybos experience this year, of course. And if I can open by asking, the Payment Trends Report pre uh, preface seems an obvious statement in the world that is rife with innovation. But what would you say is the most compelling statistic to come out of the report? What is the different about this report compared to others being released right now? Yeah, well, th thanks for having me. And I think one of the interesting things about this report is that while the industry has been rife with innovation over the last several years and we've been launching new instant payment schemes globally and all of the capabilities technically are there, the adoption, we still have a long way to go. Right? And one of the stats that we found within North America is that still the most commonly used payment method is still paper check. Right, so even though there's been billions of dollars invested in re, you know, resetting the entire foundation of instant, transparent, seamless API-enabled payments, we still have a long way to go, um, especially in the business-to-business -business space and, and in some consumer behavior trends. So I think while we show some promise, we have a long way to go to adoption and the benefits of those payments that get down to the end users and businesses, we still have a long way to go to make that a reality. Yeah, in fact, I think you're the second person I've heard say this, actually, <laughs> trying to wean people off paper. But look, generally, adoption rates among the newer channels, they are a bit more nuanced. So what data can you actually take out of the report to, to back this up? Yeah, so I, th I think what we're seeing um, across US, Canada, and even in, in the European Union is that there's a lot of testing and trial and error and specific niche adoption of the new instant real-time digital payment capabilities. So a lot of the corporations are trying it, but it's not fully brought into their entire corporation, right? They're starting with one use case, they're testing it out, they're doing proof of concepts here and there, but they haven't really leveraged it at scale to benefit their business. So I think there's still a lot of education, there's still some learning and there's feedback coming back to the industry, but it hasn't been widely adopted. The other interesting thing is that digital wallets seem to mm. be up on the rise mm. um, for corporations and businesses as a great way to pay into individuals and also collect from it. So it's not just traditional bank transfers, but it's also digital wallets of, of what we need to solve for and, and take advantage of. Now, payments transformation uh, trends, they do have implications, of course. What can banks do to keep pace with, with regulatory pressure, payment uh, competition, innovation, legacy payment methods? So there's a tremendous amount of new things in the industry right now, right? There's all many, almost too many options for banks and for corporations and for even individuals in terms of what you have on your phone and how you pay different business partners or individuals. So I think one of the things that we've realized is that you can't build everything yourself anymore. Whether you're a bank, whether you're a broker's firm, whether you're a corporation, you need to find partnerships. You need to work together with banks, with fintechs, um, and be able to aggregate things that are already there and be very conscious of what you need to build yourself versus who you can partner with to embed some of those financial services. Mm. I mean, you said earlier that lots of people are still using checks. I was one of those, but I'm, I'm pleased to say I've ditched the habit. But you still got a lot of people using physical cash, which is yes. quite interesting because during lockdown, we couldn't use cash. We had mm. to pay for things by cards, etc. And everybody said, well, that's it. COVID will signal the death knell of cash. But clearly that hasn't happened. But which new method do you think could actually think be the next check, the alternative to paper, and is it data richness that's going to have a hand in determining what that's going to be, indeed the shape that it's going to be? Because some people are still using these old methods because they don't trust the new technologies. Yeah, and, and I think the data richness is, is the key point there, um, especially in the US when we look at business to business payments. The primary reason we see of checks remaining to be over 40% of the payment market is that the data can't be read by business partners. They don't know what's being paid and they can't apply it. Right, so they stay in the check world, and the interesting thing is over the last couple decades, the industry's gotten really good at processing check and data and, and using ICR and OCR intelligent character recognition technology to pick that up and, and import that into a receivable system and those type of things. So I think we need to leverage ISO 2022, mm -hmm. common standard data sets, and make sure that business partners can seamlessly transfer what's being paid, what's owed into those systems as a catalyst to then move to the more electronic payment rails.
Now, the ITE disintermediation paper suggested many businesses are actively investing in payments technology, yet most don't believe that the primary FI fully understands their payments needs. How does that differ from what you've been seeing? I don't think it does. So I think this is kind of an interesting point, right? Banks are really good at safety, security, reliability, financial services. But when you look at the markets that we generally serve, whether it's insurance, healthcare, higher education, telecom, utility, brokerage, these are very specialized industries with all very different needs, um, different workflows, different dynamics, um, different reporting mechanisms that are required. Um, and banks can't build everything themselves individually by that. So what we try to generally do is say, what are the common capabilities of transactions, financial services that, that are scalable across all of those? And then where can we partner, invest, or acquire companies that fit that very specialized mm -hmm. need and really put that together with our core banking capabilities to deliver something that is specialized to that industry that hits the mark on the head? Because we can't build that all ourselves. So I think it goes back to the partnership versus com competitiveness between banks and fintechs, we see it more as a partnership to deliver specialized industry solutions. Yeah, I mean, it actually leads into the question I was going to ask you actually about the potential for collaboration really propelling this surge in, in innovation. Because look, the industry is racing to meet new end user demands. And yes, because some of us are still wedded to cash, we're still wedded to checks or whatever, there is that desire, if you like, or certainly it should spur that collaboration. Because the thing is, we can't use these old methods forever. At some point, they will be obsolete. Yes, 100%. Uh, I think when we're, whenever we're looking at product roadmaps and things we want to deliver to the market and, and meet, meeting the needs of our clients, right? everyone has a finite amount of capital that they can invest in building mm -hmm. themselves. Using partnerships and fintechs is, is kind of a tool to expedite your roadmap and get capabilities there for, from entities that already have it. Um, yeah. that you can plug and play and it kind of speeds up the acceleration of what you can actually bring to the market. And also reading those demographics as well amongst the consumers because it will be driven by generation change yes. too. Yes, uh, 100%. And I think the interesting thing there is that because the market is getting more and more fragmented, there's actually more options than a concentration of options, mm. right? So in order to keep up with that accelerated pace, you have to be very diligent on how you manage that balance between building versus partnering. And uh, we've got one-size-fits-all solutions perhaps have this uh, limited appeal, you could argue, a multi-prong approaches that enable a range of payment tools that, that, that rails. Have you any sort of like final thoughts on that that you'd want to get across to the guys of Cybos this year? Yeah, at, you know, looking back 10, 20 years in, in financial services, specifically payments and treasury services, it used to be kind of very finite solutions, right? You, you put something in, this is what the solution does, and we put out X. What I noticed in the last five to 10 years is that we're now microservicing a lot more of that to make it more customizable for the business that's ultimately using it at the end of the day. Every business, even if it's multiple telecom companies, multiple utility companies, they have different systems, they have different processes that have been built and stitched together over many, many years. They are not the same. Even though they may look the same on the surface, to bring a solution into that organization, you have to be able to customize. The only way to do that is to make your solution very modular. Right, so I think what we've been doing in product design is trying to microservice as much as we can, make everything very kind of fundamental. You can use this piece, you can use this piece, you can use this piece. So when you come in, it's kind of a very customizable adapter, but we don't have to rebuild it client by client. It's just modular, they can plug and play, and it kind of fits the need one by one. Okay, great vision for the future, but look, we're going to have to leave it there. But Carl Slavicki, co-head of global payments for BNY Mellon's Treasury Services. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And look, enjoy the last day of Cybos, and hopefully we'll see you next year in Toronto. Thank you. Thank you so much.